Very warm greetings in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let us turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 again. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We shall read from verses 1, verses 1 to 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Reading. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in thy house. We thank you for journey mercies despite the wet conditions. And Lord, we thank you above all for this great privilege to approach thy throne tonight to pray for thy church, thy kingdom's work, and for one another that we may live for you. And Lord, we come seeking once more for thorough cleansing, washing in the blood of our Saviour. O Lord, that our gathering tonight will be found pleasing and you would be pleased to be in our midst. And Father, we do ask that you open our eyes of understanding through your word. Lord, we live in perilous times. Help us to examine our own lives that we may know if we have been failing you and failing your church as we walk on earth. So, Lord, we pray that you remove all tiredness, distraction of the body. And, Lord, give us not only hearts to understand, but, Lord, the will to obey because these are truly perilous times. So be in our midst, we pray, for your blessing, for your namesake. In Jesus' name, amen. We are on the topic of the characteristic of children being disobedient to parents in the end times. Now, one of the key things that we must always remember, the context is about the warning to Christians, Christians, not unbelievers. Though the list of characteristics here are very close, to those in Romans, warning, uh, warnings to unbelievers. But why is the list so close? Because these are characteristics that we have grown up with. And the world will become worse and worse. So terrible a state that even after we are saved, this list of characteristics disobedient to parents being one of them, disobedient children being one of them. Of course, lovers of self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Now, all those will become so common that the Christian, even after salvation, do not feel that they are so terrible. Why? Because it's common, common among our friends, common even among Christians in churches. So I hope that we constantly remain, remember the context. So we listen with a desire to examine our own lives and say, Lord, am I still like that? Lovers of oneself, own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and now disobedient. So it applies also to adults, not just children. As adults, to your own parents, and I reminded us that this word father in the Bible often also reminds us of authorities. All right, so the Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment is not simply about fathers and mothers. Of course, it starts there. It starts in the home. But it includes authorities. That is what it is. Without obedience... Without obedience, you cannot become Christ-like. Without obedience, you cannot 
be a testimony. No matter how you talk about, I want to be a good testimony for God. Please pray for me. Do you know how to be such a Christian? It begins with training ourselves to be obedient. Obedient. Because being a testimony means being obedient to God's word. That is why we are Christ-like. And if we cannot obey our parents, those that we see through our lives, if we cannot obey parents who we know, we see, we experience firsthand their love, their care, their kindness, we will not grow up to obey God whom we do not see. We will not obey Him as we ought to. So obedience is a very crucial muscle in the Christian's life if you want to be someone who would be Christ-like. And the best example that Christ himself shown was even when he was young. The Bible says that he, he subjected himself to his parents. If God on earth would subject himself as 100% men. Now, how much more we must learn submission, which is obedience? Now, it means this, young ones, whatever, when he says Christ was subject, Christ subjected himself to the parents, it means this, that everything the parents ask him to do in the Lord Children, obey your parents in the Lord. He obeyed. Now, Joseph, Jesus, our Savior, grew up in a carpenter's home. It would mean, and we can safely extrapolate that, from young he would have been asked by the Father to help him. Go take that tool. Go do this. Here is God subjecting himself. So young ones, if you want to be someone that grew up to be godly, Christ-like, and obey God, you must learn from young, obedience. Anything that is asked of you to do that is not sinful, just react, just respond, just respond, just respond. You are training yourself to be someone that when you read God's Word, you will always respond with obedience. It begins with these things in life. Everyday life. That is why God included this in the Ten Commandments with respect to our life with parents because they are the authorities in our life that occur most closely to us, constantly giving us instructions, constantly um, correcting us. That is the best place to learn to be a godly Christian when you want to grow up. Now, it means also that if the parents were to ask Jesus, go wash the toilet, they had to do housework as well. He was from a carpenter's family. It would mean that he would not have been a rich, from a rich family, right? You saw, even as they were going to the census, how they were not very rich. They didn't have an entourage of servants following them, caring for them. So it means that Jesus did all the things that he was asked to do, whatever it was. So young ones, it's very easy, and I want to emphasize this, it's very easy to pray, Lord, make me a godly child. God, I want to be Christ-like. God, I want to be a testimony for you in the university. But, de but yet they link this whole thing about obedience, obedience to parents. Disobedience to parents is, in the first place, sin. In the second place, it is a characteristic that is not Christ-like. Remember that. Now, hence, Satan would do all he can in the end times, to cause you to be disobedient. So we saw disobedience is actually um, cool today 
In fact, if you are a very obedient child, your, your friends may mock you because you're goody goody. All right, so today, movies, songs, and so on, friends, they tout being disobedient as something cool, and then you want to be like them. Right, it's very contrary to scriptures. Songs are written to teach disobedience, and so on, right? So, we will live in the times where society and the world, which is under the control of Satan now, this kingdom of darkness, that part, he will create a society that would be disobedient to parents, disobedient to authorities. Now, it means this, and that is tonight's message. It means that the warning is not just to children. You say, what do you mean by that? If Satan has to create an environment to build young people from a young age to be naturally disobedient to authorities, instructions, um, corrections, um, laws, now what is then the best place to create that environment? Let me ask John C. Hilming. Where do you think is the best place for Satan to create that environment to make children to be like that? The home. Very good. The home. The home. Just like the commandment is given and father and mother, well, the first, the first reference is, yes, immediate parents, then also authorities, right? Because the immediate influence, if the immediate influence can be affected by Satan, then, well, the children themselves are already naturally with the sinful nature in them, disobedient, dislike authority. It is already in them. And if you can create an environment to fan that, create a situation that can groom them, create an environment that makes them feel that being disobedient is just something natural and is unavoidable, then he will succeed very powerfully. Now look at chapter 6, verse 2. God says, honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment. Not just that, but with promise. Now if you read the Ten Commandments, you read and they say, well, this is the one that is mentioned that has promises. Promises. What was the promise? The promise attached to it was, is found, now this is a quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 5, now chap verse 3, that, what's the promise? That it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. Why is there this promise? Some parents, they threaten their children from young. You better obey me. If you don't obey me, God says you can die early. All right? So children get very afraid. Just obey, obey, oh. Because if not, I may die early. Maybe die even before they die. They die that it may be well with you. You better be obedient to daddy and mommy. Otherwise, it will be unwell with you. You will fail your exams. You will not do well in life. Now, is that what it means? What do you think? Oh, sorry. Why do you think God gives this promise that it will be well with you and so that you may even live long lives on earth? Why? Why? Well, I think the answer is quite straightforward. Thomas, why? Correct. Why do we, why does God leave us on earth instead of bringing us to heaven now? We're always here. Now, remember, every parent will rescue their child. Every parent do not want their child to go through pain. We go through life on earth, 
there's lots of pain, lots of bullying against Christians, persecutions. Why does God, the Father, not take us to heaven? Very simple reason. The only reason why a parent will leave a child in that environment is because there is some reason, a good reason for it. In our case, well, it is to bear a testimony for him. To be Christ-like is so that people will see and understand who God is. They don't read the Bible. They do not know what Christ is like. So if that is the reason why God leaves us on earth, why, do you want, why, why does God say you will, you will live long on earth? It will be well with you. You will have my help, in other words, well with you. It is because if we are disobedient people, then we will not reflect Christ. If you are disobedient, it means we will disobey His commandments. I do not want to live according to all God's commandments. I'll live, I'll live according to some of them. Some of them don't suit me. I live like the world. Then there's no reason. If you continue to be disobedient, there's no reason. Much reason for God to help us. Not much reason for God to say, well, it's meaningful for you to live long on earth for me. So obedience is given. Look at verse, this commandment of obedience. Obey your parents in the Lord. Honor thy father in the Ten Commandments. The whole reason is because of our testimony on earth. Howard. 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 Oh, the child is very fast. <laughs> Here's my daddy. Or maybe I'll ask the children then. Cornelius. <laughs> right? Cornelius. What is the book of Ephesians? What is the theme about? Obedience. Um, no? Okay, how would you better remember this? <laughs> All right? Because you texted me when I finished preaching Ephesians, you texted me and said, I never realized the book of Ephesians was about this. Thank God that now I understand it. Then I asked you at Husband's Fellowship, you forgot. Right? That's how we are. We forget. That is why I'm asking you to help you. So what is the book of Ephesians about? Very good, right? It's always good to make mistakes. The book of Ephesians is about the church. Always remember that. Even when Paul brought up about marriage, he was saying that in verse chapter 5, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now everything that is brought up whether it's about our marriage and now even about children's obedience. It is about the church. Why would he? Why, why not in other, other books of the Bible? Why Ephesians? Because he wanted the Ephesian Christian to learn about church. And one of the things that contributes to the success of God's work on earth, the church work, is well, in the beginning, he covered all the things that individual singles must live by. Then he covered family, the marriage. Then now he covered about children, obedience. Everything is contributing to the church. Obedience. Satan knows if he can cause you from a young age to be someone who do not like to obey, who do who who does not like authorities, the church will fail because you are the next generation. Don't hear it like as if you are, you are the next generation means you, you are the ones and, and you are going to be so wonderful. What I mean when I say that is whether the church fails or succeeds, whether God will be in the midst of BPCWA is dependent on what kind of child you will grow up to be as an adult. That is what it means. That is why God promised Israel. Now, if I, when I give you the Ten Commandments and this particular one, this particular one, if the children are disobedient and repeatedly disobedient, why stone them to death? Because they will destroy Israel. 
Israel's testimony, they will spread this kind of living to others. That is how serious it was. It was not, well, they disrespect you, our parents kill them. No, it was about Israel. Today in the New Testament, we take over Israel as a, test, as a light. It's the same. So Paul, when he talks about the church, he has to bring this in. So young ones, you say, I want to be a godly seed, right? I want to be a godly seed means that you must have this in you, the, this obedience, this characteristic of obedience must be very strong in you. So every time you want to, you're tempted to disobey your parents, disobey your, um, any authority in your life, you must remember, this is what Satan wants to build in me, a disobedient characteristic. Best place to start, in my home. In my home. As I said last week, when you can disobey your parents who love you, who care for you, who's willing to die for you. You know that. There is very few people on earth that you will disrespect. Or practically no, no one. There's no one that you will say, well, it's so important that I'll rest. None. So the home environment. So before parents get too happy, now, if you know that that the home environment is where God plays for the training of obedience so that the person, when he grew up in school, in society, will have that kind of characteristic to bear a testimony for, for Christ, to be in the church where if God's word say this, we will obey and therefore the church will sail through and do God's work. Then you must know that the home environment is created by you as parents. Please know that. So you are also given the instruction not to, look at verse 4, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Now the world does many things. I would say it this way, the world does many things that makes it excusable for us to not trust it, therefore not want to obey it. What do I mean by that? Our government so good that we can trust it with all our hearts? No. We all know that. Very few governments are like that does not mean that we disobey the government. As long as it's not sinful, I don't trust you, but as long as it's not sinful, I will obey. That is the call of the Christian, right? We learned that. Now, Satan will do everything he can to create governments, authorities, whether it's police force, whether it's schools, schools abuse children, right? Whether it's in the workplace, all sorts of injustice, all sorts of lies, Satan will, cr will create an environment in the world where we naturally would not want to trust it and we, would, we don't trust it, we won't want to obey it, correct? Why do you think God says, after giving instructions to children, obey your parents in the Lord, honour thy father and mother, then after that, he says, and ye fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, meaning to say, don't make it any harder for them to learn obedience. It is already very difficult by their nature. And what I need is the environment, and that is why I told the children, honour you all, obey you all, because you, I, I want you, and I put them in your life, I want you to be the ones that teach them obedience. But yet... But yet, you also, you also fail. When they go out into the world, there is very little that they can trust and therefore obey and submit themselves joyfully to and learn obedience. And you also fail them at home? And at this point, I interrupt. Young ones, I said last week, Look at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. 
it means a few things. One, children obey your parents. God did not say children obey your parents who are good. It's simply parents. He did not say, honour thy good father and godly mother. No, it's simply father and mother. So, don't take this message as one that says, yeah, that's why, you know, my parents, they provoke me to wrath. That is why I didn't learn obedience. There is no excuse. You are accountable to God. God wants you to be like that. And parents, and parents, obey your parents in the Lord does not mean they are Christians. Parents in the Lord does not mean they are Christians. In the Lord means as long as it is not against the Lord's teaching, you obey. So even if they are not Christian parents, so you, you must not, if you come from an unbelieving family, say, well, you know, I can't learn obedience because it's not obey parents in the Lord. So whether they are good, godly examples and they are doing, they are parenting rightly, it is irregardless. It does not depend on that. You are supposed to learn obedience. That's all. Now, if God puts very difficult parents in your life, you, will, you actually should learn obedience even better than others. Not give excuses and say, my parents are not good. They provoke me to wrath. Very often, the toughest, the toughest teachers, the toughest military commanders build the most effective group of people. Now, tough does not mean wicked, evil. Hence, God says, and ye fathers, please don't, don't create an environment that teach them, that, fe- that, that encourages them to become more and more disobedient. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Is it only about fathers? So mothers can do that. Fathers are to show the way. Fathers are to lead the home. Fathers are also told in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about ruling the house. Means he must teach the wife as well. So the fathers must set their examples. Does it mean the father don't set an example, then the wife can follow the bad example? Obviously not. Don't read scriptures like that. But here, there is a great responsibility on the authority figure at home. Now, how do you provoke your children to wrath? How? And I want to emphasize again. Parents, you don't only be nice, be patient with an obedient child. Just like you like to tell them, well, remember, we learn. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm a good father, then you obey me. Here in verse 4, and ye fathers provoke not your good children, your obedient children. No, no adjectives described as well. Just simply, as long as it is your children. Just like as long as it is your parents. As long as it is is your your father. As long as it is your mother. That's it. No qualifying adjectives. So fathers, parents at home, you must remember your parenting has a great effect not just about the development of your children. It's about what God's work will be on earth. That is what it is about. Parenting is about, when you say, I want to bring up godly seed, some just feel that as long as my child is godly, well, means he reads the Bible, she prays, she listens to me, and that is all. No, it is always, it is always about the context that is found, the family context is found in, nevertheless, uh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Right? The family is about that. 
Well, singles who say, well, I don't have children. So, what's the lesson for me? Well, you still need to learn because you have nephew and nieces. In a sense, you are also their elders. They look up to you. You also have friends who are Christians, parents. How can you help them understand? So, what, how can we end up provoking our children to wrath? Means causing them to be angry. And when children are angry, even as adults, when we are angry, we, re we re react badly. And children, they have less, in a sense, less maturity than us, controlling themselves. They're still learning. And you create an environment that causes them to be even more um, cause them to dis dislike authority even more, to have the wrong idea about what authority is about, and cause them to be discouraged and they do not want to learn obedience. That's the worst you can do for the church of God. That's the worst you can do for God. Now, parents, God can take you home and your child can still grow up. God proved that to the parents of those who refused to enter the promised land the first time. He proved it to them. I will bring them in. You say that, well, who's going to take care of them? They're going to die if, if we cross over and we are grasshoppers and these giants will kill our children. God taught them, it, was, it is never you who protected your children. It's always, it has always been me. And if that is why you don't want to enter, then all right, I'll show you. You will all die in the wilderness, then I'll bring your children in. And nothing will go wrong with them. I'll, I will protect them. Parents, why are you still on earth? It's for the same reason that you need to bring up godly seed. You need to teach children obedience. You need to help them to understand why obedience is important and experience that obedience is good for them. Good for them to become more and more pleasing to God. They must experience that. That is why you are still around. Look at obe bringing up obedient children in that light. Just like, your, just like children in our midst need to look at obedience in the light, in the same light. So, then now we have to say, talk about practical things. Practical things. How do we provoke our children to hate authorities and not want to learn obedience? Well, I think there are many that we've covered in, um, in the past. Well, I think very clearly, very obviously in the Bible, there were cases of favoritism. Favoritism. You see, when it comes to children, when you read the Bible, children obey your parents, honor your father and mother. Then you see, what well, this is the, you know, among my children, this is the obedient one, always obeys what I say. So respectful to me, honors me. The tendency, the temptation is to exercise favoritism, right? Well, also even if, well, they're all disobedient, but there's some child that we may love more than the other for whatever reason. We have the case of Isaac, mommy's son. We have the case of Joseph, Jacob's favorite, causing so much problem. Right? So favoritism provokes your children. Now, I, why, why, why do I want to obey? Because I'm always treated unfairly. Whatever I do, whatever I do, it is still, I'm wrong. Even if I do what is right, my brother, my sister gets treated better. So they learn that, they learn to distrust authority. They learn to feel that it is, it is not worth obeying. What for? Now, I'm not saying, so I keep qualifying. So children, you must understand. Even if there's favoritism in your house, you remember, I obey my parents in the Lord. means Christ told me to do that. That's the other thing you must remember. 
In the Lord means Christ told me to be so. Submit to your husbands in everything in the Lord. Because Christ told me to be submissive. I have an un, uh, unkind husband. But because Christ told me so, to submit, I submit. So children, even if your parents practice biasness, it is the best place to train obedience. I know it's difficult, right? But remember, why did the Lord allow this in my life? So that when I go through life and I experience things that don't seem to be fair, I will continue to, because I've learned obedience at home, even at home it's like that, I will continue to obey God. I won't doubt God. I've learned always to respond in obedience, whatever the situation, whether it's favorable, favor, favorable to me or not. But parents, don't be the one that cause your child. If your child is not that mature, is still learning, don't be the one that cause them to grow up feeling that, well, authorities, my father, if my father, my mother can be like that, why should I even trust anyone anymore? especially God whom I do not see. Well, favoritism is one. Now, I have a whole long list, but I don't think I'll go through them. Maybe we'll cover them in our family seminar. Now, also about do not be someone that is hypocritical. Now, today, many do not trust the government and hence do not want to obey and do not believe in obedience to government, to authorities, because they say they are hypocrites. Meaning what? They can tell you one thing. You read the recent case in the UK, right? The Prime Minister eventually was forced to step down. Um, on the very day that he sent an edict across the nation about... Um, the, all the rules to, that they require to keep for uh, quarantine rules, but he and his team flouted it. Even the queen had to obey it, and it was about the king, the, the, her husband's death. She went through all that, only to find out that the very authorities that put all those laws in place, they were partying and drinking with one another face to face to celebrate. That's why I say we cannot trust authorities because they are hypocrites. They lie. They don't keep their promises. Now, parent, you provoke your children to think that authorities are like that when you, when you live a Christian life, that in church you are like a saint. The moment you reach church, but at home, you're a different person to your wife, to your husband, and to them. They will say, what kind of Christianity do I believe in? It must be false. Why do I want to obey God? Because if, if, it, if God is real, then my parents shouldn't be like that, right? If it's real, they will really change. But it is all fake. Why do I want to obey God? We actually literally hear parents say, you better go to church. And then the children look at them, but you don't go. This is not about me. We're not talking about me. We are talking about you. You see, you provoke your children because you set the example to them. Now, parents, when you are also someone that is unforgiving, unforgiving, children are children. They make mistakes. When they do, yes, sometimes they need to be. They need to learn through chastisements. Now, but after that, you continue to treat them like as if. Um, 
they are unforgiven. Then they will grow up also feeling the same way. There's no point obeying after I make a mistake. Because after I made a mistake at home, this is what I see of, of authorities. I guess God must be like that. What's the point? I may as well continue in my sin. No point asking God for forgiveness because my parents show that it is like that. And they're church leaders. Or they're serving in church. Right? Hypocritical, unforgiving. Now I'm just picking out some that I wrote. Now the other is this. As I just mentioned, they are children. They are teens. You are an adult. I'm not saying that all teens and children are less spiritual than parents. There are some that are more spiritual than parents, all right? Now, especially if they're unbelievers. But they are young. They make mistakes. We need to learn to be patient. Patience does not mean you don't deal with issues. But patience does not mean that you act so high and holy like you do not ever make a mistake. So what they will learn about authority is there is no second chance. Once I make a mistake, that, that is it. And they grow up always feeling that way. It affects obedience. When they learn that when I make a mistake, I repent and I start obeying, I experience forgiveness. I experience the embracing. I experience the kindness. They want to be obedient because they know they make mistakes. Unless you say as an adult, I don't ever make mistakes. When I've grown up, I'm always doing the right thing. Don't provoke them to wrath. I've already apologized. I've already repented. I've already made restitution. And then we get upset. Right? We continue to keep bringing it up. Now they are, they are learning. Now children, I say again, huh? don't keep using this <laughs> excuse. You know what to do. You purposely don't obey. Then you say, I am learning. Please, we learn that you must forgive me. And you learn, we learn that you must embrace me and, and act as if nothing happened. So it is not that, obviously. Now then, if we realize that, then now learn to, learn to listen. Don't just keep lecturing. When God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, and then he says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nurture, not bring them up in lecturing, right? Nurture has this, definitely has this idea of correcting. So please don't mistake, all right? Of doing what is needed that is right. Like a nurse, the word is often used for like nurses, uh, um, mothers, Nurture. Why is it called nurture? It means something is not right. The patient is not doing something right or the patient is not taking certain medication. So you need to step in and nurture. Get something right in the person's life. Right? But nurture, the purpose of nurture is to help the person. Now one thing about parenting that you can cause an environment where they hate Instructions means hate obedience, right? It's when it's just constant lecturing, lecturing. Not, they don't see it as something to help them spiritually. They see it as something else because you are doing it simply out of, I just want you to obey me. I just want you to listen to me. I just want you to do what I say. They cannot, they don't relate it, they don't understand it in the light of scriptures. This nurture and admonition, what? Of you. Bring them up in the lecture of, put your name there. No. The nurture of the Lord. Help them to understand the spiritual benefits of why you need to tell them something. I'm going back to the young people. As I've said last week, don't obey, don't have this characteristic. I will only obey if I understand. I will only obey if you tell me nicely. Remember, obey your parents, that's it. In the Lord, that's it. 
Not obey your parents who talk to you nicely. Obey your parents who explain to you the reason. But parents, when it comes to parents, God does say, nurture them in, in the emanation of the Lord. Help them to understand. Well, sometimes when they're very young, they do not understand. But you still need to think, how do you relate it to God? I am not forcing you, I am not lecturing you because I want to control you. I need you to understand, you are sinning against God. And I remember a parent was, who, who was, was very defiant. And then the parent, I said, how do you deal with it? Well, still would not listen, still want to be defiant. And then the parents, the father said, well, if you, want to be, if you want to continue like that, then I have to tell you, you have to understand, God will not hear your prayers because the Bible says, if we regard iniquity in our heart, He will not hear your prayers. Do you want to continue like that? And you continue, to re continue in your sin and don't want to repent? Don't want to re say sorry and repent and change? Well, then you always remain under God's anger. You want that? Okay, it's up to you. It's not about daddy and mommy being angry at you and that is all. See, that was make the child cry. And the child said, no, 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 no. I, 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 want to, I want to come back. I want to change. I want to change. See, you have to help them understand. Provoke you know, your children to wrath is when they begin to feel, you are just wanting me to do this because of your own selfishness. That is why we don't like governments, Right? Or I should say, the world doesn't like government. They always suspect that what the government wants is always for their own good, not for the good of the people. So they, they are provoked to be angry at governments. So you have, you have to never, the next thing, never chastise. Never, um, the next one, admonition of the Lord, right? Admonition means, now this means there is scolding. Right? Nurture, you correct lovingly, but you have to correct. You have to teach. But now, if they don't, then it moves to ammunition. Ammunition involves scolding, involves chastisements. When you do so, never do so in anger. We said this many times never do so in anger. They know. How you respond. You just raise and you whack and then they look at your face. It is about you, not about them. Not about helping them to change. Not about helping them to obey God. Not about helping them to learn, to control their will. They don't see that. You just provoke them to be angry because they know that you're, you are just hitting them because you are venting out your anger at them. Now, please do not misunderstand me. The Bible is clear. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod. So the Bible tells us, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Any parent here who still does not believe in using the cane. I'm not just saying using the cane all the time, all right? We are talking about when, when the child is constantly, repeatedly refusing to respond wanting to, uh, constantly refusing to respond and defiant. If you think that it's unloving, the Bible says the opposite. Using the cane rightly is not provoking your child to wrath. Using he, he that spared the rod hateth his son. Why? Because God will have to deal with your son when your son grows up, never learning obedience, never learning to control his will, knowing that there is punishment. But God says, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes, when it's necessary. He loveth him. Why do you love your child? Because I need my child to learn obedience to God, not to me. They must learn obedience to God. They must learn that obeying me is about learning obedience to God. What I, instructions I give them is about learning obedience learning to submit to authority because that is what God wants. So don't make them do things that is just simply out of your selfish, um, power-hungry pride, all right? Now, then the last one, the last one. Oh, by the way, on this, 
Now, public discipline, embarrassing them, don't do that. All right? You provoke them to wrath. You publicly discipline them in front of other people. Now, I'm not saying there's no place for any public discipline at all because in, in, in the case of um, the Old Testament, they brought the child out to the elders and then the whole Israel gather, right? But it is never done for embarrassing. It was done to teach. Right? So parents, be careful of doing it out of, I want to shame you in front of others. Right? I want to embarrass you. Sometimes it's not this physical corporal punishment. It is verbal. Right? We go to you in front of their relatives or in front of friends. Why are you so stupid? I've told you so many times. Why can't you be? Don't compare. Why can't you be like this person in church? Be like that person in church. Why can't you be like your sister, your brother? Why can't you? You see, again, they will begin to be provoked to wrath. Oh, so this is not about obedience to God. This is not about learning to be right. This is about, oh, I am not as good as someone else. Remember that. You're provoking them to wrath. You're not provoking them to learn to be the best Christian they can be. Now, of course, you better learn, you better ensure their salvation, right? From a young age, that's the point. Otherwise, it's very difficult to teach them this thing. But it doesn't mean I don't know if my child is safe, so I won't discipline. I wait until it's safe. You don't learn, teach them discipline before they're safe. Why would they want to obey God to get saved? In fact, they will hate God for, for dishing out punishment of hell. So, I think I'll just stop here. But you get the idea. You get the idea. Don't create that environment. But I conclude this part of this, this message about this, this um, disobedient to parents as this. Now, both must remember. Both must remember. Obedience is a training. Both must remember. A training to obey God. Children, if your parents are not good, they are not godly, you just remember, I am training myself to be someone who is obedient to anything that God will say, and I will learn it. I, if God wants me to learn it the most difficult way, it is good for me. Parents, why do you want to teach your children obedience? To bring up godly seed? Meaning to say, they must understand. They must understand the instructions, the corrections, And at times, you need to listen to them. You provoke them to wrath when you jump to conclusion that they did something wrong, they said something wrong, when it's not their fault. They say, but I am parent. And you, you chastise them straight away. The Bible says that we should be slow to wrath. The Bible says slow to speak, quick to listen. They will, they, you must Teach them that it's worthwhile. If I explain, it's really not my fault. Daddy, mommy will listen. They will learn that obedience is worthwhile. All right? So some of these examples. So it is both ways, but it is always because the work of God is dependent on, these, on obedient people. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father. Lord, we live in perilous times and Satan will do all he can to make us disobedient to authorities, especially our parents. And also make parents fail by parenting in a way that will teach children that obedience is not worthwhile. The authorities are evil and can never be trusted. So, Lord, help us, not for our namesake, not for our children to be good in society, but because, Lord, your kingdom's work dependent, is dependent on whether we are obedient children and we are parents that parent correctly. Be with us in the place of prayer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.